Hello, and welcome to another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon. Today, we're going to have a discussion about how you come up with story ideas and how you take that germinating thought of an idea and you carry it through into a full-blown story and how you decide how long the story is, you know, how many com complications you add to it and so forth and so on. But before we get into that, my name is Marie Mullaney, and I am a YouTuber and fantasy author. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Drake. I am Drake. I'm an award-winning novelist. I teach writing all over the world. And I'm really excited for today's little discussion because, man, you haven't even discussed this <laughs> offline, really. So yeah. this is going to be an interesting discussion. And before, before, before we get into it, remember to hit the thumbs up button. Hit the subscribe button, share with your friends. You know, the algorithm is a tyrannical thing. But the one way that you can fight tyranny, the way that you can be a brave hero is by sharing this with your friend and not letting the algorithm dominate us. And then for the algorithm, you can hit the like button, please. And thank you. <laughs> okay. We actually forgot to do that in our <laughs> last did. podcast when I was the one introducing it because, you know, I'm terrible. So um, today's topic came about because we were discussing things that we, we can talk about on the podcast. And one of the things we haven't spoken about much, we've, we've spoken a lot about the craft of writing and the art of writing. But one of the things we haven't spoken about as much is the art of storytelling and where stories come from and that kind of thing. So I thought in this podcast, we could go back to like the start of storytelling and be like, where, where does that idea come from? And how do you build it out into a full plot? So would you like to start, Drake? Where do you get your inspiration from? Well, I'll, I'll, I will tell my funniest story. And I may have told it on this podcast. I don't remember. Um, but this was years and years and years ago. I don't remember where I was driving, but I was driving somewhere in Vegas and I was, I think I was on the strip or, you know, near the strip or whatever, driving somewhere. And there was a billboard and it made me laugh. But by the time I got to where I was going, it had generated an entire short story that I ended up writing and it got published somewhere. I don't remember exactly where it got published, but uh, the billboard said, visectomies, it's easier than you think. And that was it. That was the whole billboard. And by the time I got to where I was going, I had created a little short story about how the government had, you know, first marketed to try to to control population. And then when that didn't work, they got this idea that, hey, maybe we could put something in the water just to slow down population. And then, as governments do, screwed everything up and the entire world was sterilized. Um, and so that's where that idea came from. It literally came from a billboard <laughs> of <laughs> bisectomies. It's easier than you think. <laughs> So if I think of Magic Fall, which is the book we wrote together, uh, go check it out and buy a copy if you don't have one already. Then starvingwriterstudio.com. Starvingwriterstudio.com. You can get a signed copy um, or you can get the EPUB off Amazon if you're an EPUB person. Or you can get both. They have different interior art. I'm just saying. Anyway, um, so the idea for Magic Fall came from whale falls so i don't know if if everybody knows what a whale fall is but it's basically when a whale dies somewhere in the ocean where its carcass sinks unimpeded down to the bottom and it then lies there and then this attracts all of these scavengers that come to that carcass and they you know they strip away the skin and they eat the meat and they eat the bones and they eventually there's almost like this it takes five odd years you know and it, it spawns its whole own self-contained ecosystem yeah it's like it's like one of those gold mine cities in california back in the 1800s yeah. or 1700s or whatever yeah. that would just appear because mm. they found a carcass of gold a uh, gold vein yes. and it would just be you know because you'd need everything that the miners need. So you need supplies and food and drink and prostitution and gambling and, you know, entertainment and all these other things. And so, you know, hmm. people that are supplying that stuff come there to basically yeah. feast off the carcass of the gold mine. So I 
for for Magic Fall, I had the idea of a civilization that there's something that falls out of the sky. So so I did a video on Whalefall on my world building channel. I did a video on, you know, how you could use it, the fantasy world and so on. And it sparked an idea for me for having this advanced civilization where satellites that contain high technology that is used to fuel the, the remaining tech that these people have, how that satellite falls to the ground and then, you know, you people need to go and get this um, high tech which they don't fully understand. They think of it as kind of magic. So they have to go get it from this fallen creature. Hence magic fall. Hence magic fall. Um, so that was um, that was where that idea came from. And you can still see, I guess, the germinations of that in the final book. But obviously, like, that is just, it's a start. Right. It's it's a it's a key core. It's like you know, vis- vasectomies. It's easier than you think. It's right. it's <laughs> it's a little idea. Yeah, and that's really, I think yeah. that's what people miss. They 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 see this fleshed out idea, mm. um, and then they're like, they're like, I can't believe that you came up with this idea. Like, well, we didn't. Yeah. Like, we didn't come anywhere close to this. So, yeah. Snurs, um. A magic magic fairy tale that that children's movie that I've optioned twice now, um, and actually two producers are now looking at it right now. So I may end up optioning it a third time. Um, it's starting. I've told this story before. Uh, me and my wife were driving home from probably her work because we were on Jones, and her her work is down that road, and we were heading home because we were just coming up to the highway to pass over it. And there was a license plate in front of me, which I've seen many times since then, and I've even taken pictures of it just for nostalgia. But I read the license plate and I went, huh, Snurse. That's an interesting name. <laughs> and then, of course, I, in my dyslexia, I had missed the letter. And so my mother's like, what are you talking about? That says senior nurse, S-R, nurse. So I had, I had omitted the R and I just read it as Snurse. <laughs> but I don't care because it was an interesting name. And then I was like, huh, what race would name would give a name of snurse and i and i and before we got home i had created this little fizz bear thing and i was like oh and i just started i don't even know where my mind was at you know at that time uh the boys were younger or whatever and so i ended up coming up with a magical fairy tale that ended up becoming snurse um but i got it from the license plate senior nurse so somewhere here in vegas somebody has a car that literally spawned my idea for that so but snurse isn't anything i mean there's no cars or license plates or any of that stuff in it it's just it was an interesting name that made me start thinking because of wherever my mind was at that's the other thing is it also depends on where you're at as a human being in your day-to-day life of what you're thinking about and and how things are are interacting with you yeah so for sangwheel for the first book for hidden blade the original idea was born from a from a comic book idea. A friend of mine was putting together comic books and she'd asked me to sort of um, contribute as a writer. But then in the end, my artist fell through. So all I had was like these panels that I mapped out in terms of story. I was like, this picture, should, this kind of a picture should go here and this is the kind of the dialogue and so on. And so it was this 10 page kind of bullet pointish thing of um, this assassin who, you know, is sent on this mission. And the idea was that it would be kind of this serializable um, assassin that uses the shadows and uses blood magic and goes on various missions, a very kind of James Bond kind of concept. And that was the original start of, um, of Hidden Blade. And again, you can see elements of it in the final book product you know louis goes on a sat on these quests of course hidden blade is technically kind of almost his i won't say it's his last mission but it's you know the next book then goes on to different things because the problem is what's serializable as a comic book is not serializable as prose like i know ian fleming did it and he did very well with it with serializable james bond but 
it wasn't what I wanted to write. Right. <laughs> like I didn't want to write the same book 50 times and, right. and come up with a different title because that's effectively what yep. with with a with the best will in the world and with all the love to the James Bond fans, it is a formula. <laughs> yeah, 100 percent Um yeah, and and I don't know if I have anything exactly like that. The Genesis saga. I actually got the idea for it because there were two tropes in fantasy that I was tired of seeing. Mm. Not only was I tired of seeing them, in my opinion, they're stupid and they're massively used like over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so I wanted to, to basically buck that system, you know, those two systems. And it was one, the farm boy leaves the farm. And by the end of the story, he's the best mage and the best fighter and the best everything. And I really hate that. Um, and two, it was the, um, why did you become the villain and try to kill all of humanity? Oh, because my brother became the hero. I'm like, wait, so you became a serial killer because your brother became a doctor? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And so those were the two tropes that I wanted to really crush in Genesis, which I think I do. Yeah. Um, so I, But I, then the so, idea sprang from there. Yeah. So I also had... And so that they weren't the core part of this, the the initial story idea. The initial story idea it was this assassin character, but that there were there were tropes that I disliked that informed some of the characters. So, for example, it is such a common trope that there is a stern father in the background with either a daughter character or a son character who has a difficult, complicated relationship with it. And I was just like, why is it always a father? Do, do you people think mothers can't be complicated and stern? <laughs> yeah, then they haven't seen yeah. that movie that I can't even think of the name of it, but it's no wire hangers. Yeah. <laughs> beating the crap out of them with a wire hanger. Yeah. yeah. So so that's why I made um Louis a male character and herself. Uh, you know, his mother, the, the complicated stern figure in the background. Um, and I still, like, I don't think I've ever seen that that name, title, whatever, but just the fact that she's called herself is just <laughs> so amazing to me. I really do love that. Thanks. I I, I am very pleased with that one. Um, so that was the one trope that I wanted to to knock down uh, was, was that one, or at least to subvert in some way. And then the other thing is I have the same farm boy problem you have. I, I hate the trope where the dude comes off the farm and suddenly he's like, he's the chosen one. He's, it's like, what, why? So, and that's why Louis is a nobleman and he has spent his entire life training to be an assassin. He is a growing up assassin. He's a, right. you know, he's a 27 year old man, a 26 when we meet him the first time, who is very good at his job right yeah. um right. he comes out the gate good at his job <laughs> so and so i have two farm boys yeah. and the thing that no one notices about that series that i think is hilarious because no one's ever commented on it not for good or for bad and you always know you do you mm -hmm. you've done something right if no one even notices it mm -hmm. um i mean it's always good I guess, to have them notice and go, oh, look at how amazing you did this. But I don't know. There's something magical about doing something that is so well done that it becomes invisible to the story, hmm. um, especially when you're doing stuff that could really destroy the story. So like this, um, the two brothers literally are victims through the entire uh, story, you know, and they have two different stories. They don't even touch in book one. But neither of them do anything until the very end. And then the only thing each does is this, like, one of them makes the decision to sacrifice himself um, hmm. if to save the, the woman he loves. And so it's like, look, fine, I'll do this and I'll do this willingly, but you leave her alone. Because hmm. uh, they're both basically captives at that point. Hmm. And the other one stands up to his father. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's it. He's just like his father's, you know, at the end of it, his father denies him from being able to finish the quest. And he's like, but then I wouldn't be the man you raised me to be. Like, what What do you, what do you, like, you would literally now become a failure of a father um, because I've promised that I would do this thing. And that's it. That's literally like, like they don't kill anything. 
they don't they don't like accomplish anything they don't overcome anything and no one notices it um and some of that has to do with because some of the other characters in the story are so freaking powerful and so freaking you know badass to overcome the different things they come you get that satisfaction through those story arcs where you don't get it with the two brothers but i don't think you miss them either with the two brothers but then you know what happens in book one when you get into book two that's when they start realizing their potential and they both start growing through book two and i think that that was one of the interesting things we did in magic fall as well when we built on that idea was to say in book one they're not going to kill anybody neither of our characters are going to kill which is odd for many fantasy books these days like um and I think it adds an element of innocence to our two characters, even at 17 years old. Yeah. You know, obviously, like Louis, by contrast, has a body count, you know, larger than most people would ever want. But he's an assassin. (laughs) You know what you're in for. (laughs) Right. Well, Um, but I mean, the, the other thing I love about Magic Fall is it's not that they don't even kill anything. They never even contemplate killing anything. Like they never when and they're in some very, very dangerous situations, mm. but it's always about like this is beyond us. Mm. Like we just need to just stay the frick out of everybody else's way. Let's just we need to survive is what we need mm. to do. We don't need to be thinking about hunting anything down or whatever. We just need to not get killed. And I think that's a very realistic mm. approach for not just a 16, 17 year old, but like most people <laughs> yeah um yeah. so yeah you know especially if you're doing like a farm boy euro you know a a, a not like you draw you're drawing somebody into the heroic tale reluctantly and without the skill set you're doing a fish out of water yeah now and and this is it's a big difference in writing these two types of stories you're either doing fish out of water or you're not Right. Now, if you're not, okay, then you're writing a story like Dresden Files, not a fish out of water. Dresden right. has got a whole bunch of magical skills. He owns a gun with which he can shoot. He can shoot straight. He's fast on his feet because he trains a lot, you know. Um, Anita Blake, vampire hunter, again, absolutely not a fish out of water. She's a necromancer. She owns a gun. She runs. She does judo. You know, she is prepped and ready for contact. Right. Well, and, to to just expand yeah. upon that from the theoretical side, what basically it boils down to is um, it has to do with whether your character is at odds with his environment when you start or at peace with his environment when you start. So a farm boy is at odds with his environment when he starts because mm-hmm. he's in a world that he's never been in. And yeah. so therefore, the the progression through that is going from at odds with my world to at peace with my world. And then the other side of it is you know, Louis starts completely at peace with everything that's going on. And then the transformation is him going to become at odds with the world that, that he's comfortable with. And so that's a part of that conflict growth. And that, that's a it's, I don't think that's a theory that a lot of people talk about, but that's a very elemental theory that that I feel like is probably, you know, I've never really looked into it, but it's probably in, if not most, you know, all, all most stories, you know, you have this you're either at peace with the world and you're going to become not at peace with it, or you're um, not at peace with it. And you're going to eventually become at peace with it. And I guess, I mean, that's very true because if you start with a not fish out of water, okay, if, if you are comfortable in your environment, like Louis, like Dresden, like Anita Black, like all those characters, then your conflict, because remember all stories must have conflict. Okay? So mm-hmm. if you have a farm boy, if you are not at peace with your environment, then that is your conflict. And that's why and, it's and that's why it's often used, right? Because it is an easy conflict. I'm not saying that's a bad just, thing. I'm just saying it's an easy conflict. Right. Just to clarify, yeah. we're not talking about at the beginning of the story. Obviously, the farm boy yeah. when he's on the farm. Yeah. But the story hasn't started yet. That's the Everman moment where we're still building this. The yes. story starts when he gets kicked out and he becomes that fish yeah. out of water. So just I just wanted to throw that in there just to make sure that everyone's like, well, wait a minute. When he starts on the farm, he's at peace with his environment. Yeah. Um, but then again, technically, that theory, theory still works because now the beginning of the story he starts at peace with his world and it you know ends up in conflict yeah. um yeah. but technically not because most farm boy stories 
their, I don't want to be on the farm, you know, I want to be an adventure and I want to be out there riding dragons. And I, so they're really not at peace with the world around them. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that of what we, what we mean by that. We're not necessarily talking about the everyman moment. Yeah. So, so um, from, from the perspective of, of the not fish out of water, you have to still bring in conflict. So the conflict that is most often brought in for the not fish out of water is an internal conflict that challenges their worldview. And that is the conflict that they overcome in the story. That's what I did with Louis as well. Like he goes through an entire arc where his worldview is challenged by the events of the story, by his own actions and so on. And that ends up with him being both a different man and not entirely as at peace with what he is as he was at the start. So yeah. when you're setting up your character, you have to think about this story that you wanted to tell. You have this germinating idea. This story that you're wanting to tell, is it best told from the perspective of a fish out of water who is going to transition into comfort of you know, through this plot idea. They're going to master themselves or they're going to master the world or they're going to master, you know, the environment or whatever, their relationship, whatever. Whatever they're going to master, they're going to become at peace with it. Yes. Or are they conversely, are they comfortable in this world and is the events that happen here going to challenge their worldview and change them to no longer fit that world as neatly? It's one or the other. Right. Um, it shows my age, but one of the examples that I always use for the latter of the two is Logan's Run. Mm. So Logan's Run is a movie that came out in the 70s. Uh, basically, the main character is a guy named Logan, and they live in a bubble. The, the entire mm. world is this one little city, and nobody works, and everybody just has sex and eats and drinks, and that's it. There's just all entertainment. However, to maintain this way of life, they can't have anyone over the age of 30. So you're born, you're raised in the society, you literally live a life of nothing but pleasure. And then on your 30th birthday, you voluntarily go into this room and you die. And all of your body is recycled to create a new baby. And, you know, because everything is done by machines behind the thing, because they don't even know how to procreate, like yeah. they're all sterile or whatever. And so well, talk about at peace with this world. Logan believes so much in the society that he is a they, they only have one type of cop because mm -hmm. there's only one crime and that's called running if you don't voluntarily go and be killed then they hunt you down and kill you mm -hmm. because you're you're just the worst type of human being that you could possibly how could you be so mm -hmm. selfish to besides you're you're so old i mean you're 30 who wants to be that old um so you know when we meet him he believes in the society so much that he hunts and kills other people who break this tenant. And then, of course, he turns 30 and he realizes, huh, 30's not that darn old now, is it? And so he runs. And that's why it's called Logan's Run. Mm. And so, like, you can't get a better mm. example of that than, than that movie because the entire premise is about you know, being 100% comfortable with your environment and it, it's, it's your religion. And mm -hmm. then all of that is world shaking and shattering. And so, yeah, both are fun to play with, but that's really, you know, we, we break it down those little base elements. That's kind of what you're doing. So yeah, when, when you, now you got your idea, so it's now, okay, what characters could be used to tell this story, to actually, you know, be the vehicle that would deliver this to the audience. And yeah. that's the next thing that, you know, most of us think about. And that also depends on, on, on the theme that you want to kind of explore. But I also want to say, don't marry your theme early on. Because for example, if I think back again to Magic Fall, we had thematic elements that we wanted to tell. We wanted to show like, you know, the, the starvation of the society and people being driven into doing these dangerous actions in order to keep the society running and so on. But we also had individual character arc themes. Like we knew that, you know, for, for Buri, we wanted to show her growing from 
living moment to moment to actually taking a step back and and considering life before she takes action so to sure. reduce her impulsiveness but with lyron the path was less clear until we hit a point in the third act in our, in our plotting where Drake, I swear you said something like, I want him to do this. And I was like, okay, but if he does that, what is the lesson he's learning here? Like, what is his actual thematic lesson? And that was in the end why we did something else there, um, why we had him choose to do something else. Because it was there that we finally hashed out that Lyron's arc is about overcoming a kind of impersonal kind of racism you know a racism that exists because of his class that is not he is not a racist in the sense of a directed you know bigotry it's just he was born in this class and this class is racist so he is racist yeah and that's usually the way it works for me i usually don't come up with a thematic element up front I usually have to start thinking and plotting and coming up with scenes and then asking those scenes, what are they, you know, because every time I create a scene there, I always have a section below. It. It's like, what themes does this scene convey to an audience? Because every scene, if if you don't know anything about a theme and you never think about a theme and you don't do, don't care nothing about a theme, every scene you create has a theme. It does because you can't tell a story without it having some human implications to it otherwise it's not really a story um you know in in dynamic story creation i write this like two or three page story about a dude walking down a street and this that's it like literally he just walks down a street and he crosses the street and like nothing actually happens and i'm like that's a story without a thing yeah. because there's no it's just the event of walking on the street he sees stuff he talks to somebody, but no, I I wrote it in a way that literally there's no theme. And it's this, it's horrible. Yeah. It's just a yeah. God awful story. Because it's very um, bad. But, but so no matter what you create, if you're writing a scene where somebody does something and something happens, then there's going to be a, 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 a subliminal underlying message that's going to be there. Even if you're not thinking about it. So I, I, it depends for me. So, for example, with Hidden Blade, I knew from the beginning what my theme was. My my theme with Hidden Blade was always, do the ends justify the means? Like, is that is that, you know, where is the line? If you say right. the ends justify the means, where is the line? Is it at 51%? You know, um, and... And so, <laughs> so I mean, that's the thing, like that's, that's, you know, um, and, and that's the, li that's the li kind of line that I play with. Um, and that, that's the question that I wanted to ask in, in that book. So I always knew that, but there are also, your, just because that's your overall theme doesn't mean that there aren't additional minor thematic elements and Elements that have got to do with a character's growth arc that might not be specific to that thematic question. So, right, right. you know, kind of be quite, be a little bit flexible in in your theme, um, in your yeah. in choosing your theme. And then there's there's other there's two more examples. Uh, just continuing to talk about where the story ideas come from. Um, just to just to make sure that it's sometimes it is that inspiration moment or whatever. Actually, I want to go through three. Actually, the first should be fairly quickly. It really upsets me when people are like, "Oh, I don't like reading or I don't like watching stuff because I don't want it to influence me." It's like, dude, you need to be influenced. Like that's a part of it because yeah. every time I watch or consume any type of stories in any medium, I'm always thinking, "Oh, okay, what did they do wrong? What, what could I have done better?" or or that idea is cool. And that leads me to this other cool idea. Like I'm constantly, I can't watch something without creating stories. Hmm. Not, not fanfic stories where I'm going, oh, I want to write these characters in this world. I've never done that. So I've never understood the attraction of fan fiction. Hmm. Um, not, I mean, as in a, as a writer, I understand fan fiction is great. And I've read plenty of it. Um, 
but I've never had a desire to write it because I've never had a desire to write in somebody else's stuff. Hmm. Um, except for like Sony when they were paying me, you know, too much money to not do it. Um, but so you should watch and read and consume and constantly think about how it could generate new ideas for you. And I probably get most of my ideas that way. Um, hmm. That is definitely where I get a lot of ideas from. But the, but the two that I want to talk about in particular, um, because one may be resurfacing. Uh, I've been trying to get it to resurface for a long time because it's my one dark cloud hanging over my head. Um, but I have a comic book series and it never came out. Um, and there's a chance that it might get finally resuscitated because I've been trying to do it for years. But um, it started, it didn't start off of any thematic idea. It didn't start off of any anything. It started off of, I went, okay, I want to do a post-apocalyptic comic book that just has no ending. It has no climb, you know, ultimate climax or whatever. It's just literally survive, move, survive, sort of like The Walking Dead. Um, and so what I did with that was I went, okay, I want as many toys to play with as possible. So, okay, it's post-apocalyptic, so I need to figure out how the society collapsed and, and what the world's like on there. But I also want, you know, some weird mutations and weird mutant monsters. And and then that leads me to weird mutant diseases. And then I was like, oh, well, then I also have some humans are born albino and they have weird uh, um, psychic powers and, and stuff like that. And I was like, I also want aliens. How can I work aliens in here? You know, but I don't want to do an alien invasion story. So like they didn't invade. So what do I got to do to get that in? And then I was like, I also want dinosaurs. How do I get dinosaurs into this? Because I really want dinosaurs. And so, and then a, an underground government agency that survived the, the the apocalypse, but they're still trying to, you know, rise up and take, like, I just started throwing stuff into the writer's toolbox where I was like, <laughs> yes, I'm going to put that in there. I'm going to put this in there. I'm gonna put and then once I had this whole bucket of just crazy things, I sat down and went, all right, how can I have an earth? It's in the future. It has aliens that didn't invade and dinosaurs and, you know, you know, psychic people and underground governments and bandits and all this crazy stuff. And so then I took a step back and that's when I was like, started churning through ideas. And finally I figured it out and it incorporates the destruction of the dinosaurs 160 million years ago. It, 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 it incorporates, um, why Mars, one big theory of why Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. It incorporates all sorts of actual real mm. world stuff and science into it and everything like that. Um, and then of course on the first page, I have my favorite joke of, cause it's like 2253 or something like that. And they're driving to work and it's like, why is there no damn flying cars? I mean, in 1960 <laughs> World Fair, they said we would have some flying cars. It's 2253, where's my damn flying car? And so I just, that's the first joke right out of the gate. Um, but yeah, so I just, I had thrown everything into this toolbox to, that I just wanted to play with. And mm. then I had to figure out how to make it all work. And I think I did a really good job with it. I'm really excited about this story, but we'll see mm. if it happens. Okay. Um, so that's another way to do it. Just think about, I, you know, just think about things you want to write about. You know, so maybe you're like, oh, you know, I really want to write about vampires. Um, yeah. and then just start throwing all sorts of crazy stuff in there about what you like about vampires and, and also include things, you know, an, a, a negative bucket. Like, I don't want to write any vampires that sparkle in the sunlight. Like you just throw that in that bucket and then you know that that's, that's a limitation. It's out. So that's another way to kind of come up with ideas is just start thinking about, I'm really interested in X that's, and, you know. That's kind of how I did the erotica, uh, mm, yes. the erotica that I did. I was like, I want to do fairy. I want to I want to include fairies. I want it to be kind of in the dark ages setting, you know, our world, dark ages, Europe, that kind of setting. And I want it to be obviously an erotica. So um, and, a, and a leaning into the kind of um, BDSM kink. Um, and you know, you just toss all of that together and you know, give it a good stir. But it and there it's also a little bit genre specific. Yep. So 
in the case of like the erotica, for example, you know you're writing predominantly for a female audience. Yes, there are men who read erotica, but they're not like the majority of your audience. The majority of your audience for erotica would be women. Hmm. So you want a female, um, you want a female POV character. And you want probably, if you're writing the BDSM kink scene, you probably want her to be the submissive one. It's the more popular kind of pick. Again, I'm not saying there aren't women who are dominant, you know, but it's the it's more on the other side. And you probably want um then to also think about, you know, you, you you've got to think about the audience you're writing for here with those kinds of genres is, you know, um and, and actually I'll expand upon that. I think yeah. you really need to understand every audience that you're writing for. Um, yes, I mean, it's absolutely important for what you're doing, but I think it's absolutely important for fantasy. I think it's absolutely important for all of them. So so yes, and I'm going to push back a little bit because so for the erotica and for urban fantasy and so on, there are, it, it is a very specific kind of fan base. Mm -hmm. Now, Sangwheel, yes, obviously you must think about your epic fantasy author. Uh, your epic fantasy audience. And I do think about my epic fantasy audience, but it is a more eclectic thing. The conventions aren't quite as there. You know what I mean? Like erotica is a very specific genre. Like, yeah, you know, and they want a very specific thing from those books. And if yeah. those books don't deliver, they won't buy them. Like, but you know. Romance in general is that. Yeah. And the same thing with uh, mysteries. I mean, yeah. the the overarching theme of every single mystery is justice will be served. Yeah. You know, that's what those people crave. That's what the audience craves. Like my wife is big into mysteries. She mm. lives in an unjust world. She doesn't want to go into a murder mystery where the like I like this like Hannibal where the mm. serial killer gets away. She will not watch that because that is literally does not feed her unknowing expectation that she's looking for. Mm. And but I don't I don't need to live in a world where justice is always served um so you know that's why i'm i can be a fan of your more psycho thrillers where she's like nope but she'll watch and read anything that's actually a murder mystery because she knows at the end of it justice is going to be served mm -hmm. and so yeah it, that's that's with with anything where you know but i mean you know epic fantasy is kind of the same way like um um because if you get down to that that thematic element I read Joe Ambercrombie's uh, First Law series mm -hmm. solely because everyone told me that the book didn't end with the heroes overcoming the the quest. And I'm like, there's no way. There's literally no way. Nobody would publish that. Nobody would read that. There's no way that that happened. And so I literally read it because that's what everybody kept telling me. And they were all wrong. It absolutely does happen. The problem is it happens at the beginning of book three. And the whole quest is over and everything's done. And then for the rest of the book, they go home and everybody gets screwed and yeah. <laughs> dies or thrown in jail or becomes a puppet or a slave or whatever. But the quest that they were on, the epic quest, 100 percent is you know completely done and over. It's just that then he's like, and let me show you what life was like for them after this story was over, which I think was a mistake. Um but without finishing the quest, if they had all just got screwed over and they never actually saved the world, no one would would have enjoyed that book at all. Nobody. Um, because that is something that you kind of have to have in, in the fantasy realm. We want it's 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 sort of in the same vein of we want to see justice served. We want to see the world saved. You can you can go to town. You can have people suffer. You can have them make mistakes. You can have them lose people. You can you can have you them, them have to, to the finish line in whatever state. Doesn't matter. But they have to actually save the world. If they don't save the world, then what am I reading? Right. You. <laughs> that is the yeah. unknown expectation that epic fantasy fans have, and so, I mean, it's one of the reasons why everyone's so let down by game of thrones the tv show and why i don't think martin is ever going to finish it because i don't think he ever wants anybody to get over the finish line and so therefore so 
I, do, I don't agree with you on why that's why people are so disappointed with Game of Thrones because they do save the world. They do counter the Night King. The problem is the way they save the Night King, right. the way they defeat the Night King, unsatisfying. is com- completely unsatisfying. It comes out of nowhere. It makes no sense. It completely ignores the lore that has been building up since book one. But it's that's... Like- that's what? literally why from the time of the Greeks, we've had Deus Ex Machina. Yeah. Stop having God in the machine <laughs> save everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's everyone hates those endings. I don't know why people keep producing them. Yeah. No, it was it was it was very like the, the, the way that they did the overcome of the Night King was just it was just terrible. I yeah, <laughs> I've got nothing. Um, and the ridiculous part of it is, I know for a fact it wasn't in the notes that Martin gave them because Martin has subsequently come out and said that is not how the Night King is dying in the books. <laughs> if he ever finishes them, that's not how he's dying. <laughs> um, I also don't think he's finishing them, but regardless. Um, so so they they subsequently gave an interview where they were like, oh, well, we just thought it would be fun and it would subvert expectations. And I was like, how about I subvert your face? (laughs) And that's just a sign of a completely immature storyteller that does not understand their job in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And yes, I'm saying that publicly. I don't care. Like if you don't understand what the job of a storyteller is and giving it, you know, a satisfying ending uh, but I it's it's the reason why and you know everyone hates me for this but it's the reason why I'm not a Neil Gaiman fan I I think he is the best writer the best character developer the best world builder the best prose you know literally best audiobook reader like I love his voice the man cannot write an ending he just can't and so struggle with endings I don't like him like I just if you can't do that you literally are, that's the biggest failure in my mind of a storyteller is not being able to pull off that ending. Well, I mean, I, lo- I like a lot of his books, so that's okay. Yeah, yeah but- no, he's <laughs> everyone else in the world but me loves him to death. So I know I'm way on the outside of that. But um, um, I-, I will but- also say if anybody's on the fence about watching Good Omens 2, go watch Good Omens 2. If you love Good Omens 1, you will love Good Omens 2. See, and I've heard the exact opposite. I've heard because I actually gave him credit for Good Omens one that it because the that's my only Terry Pratchett book that I didn't like mm. because it doesn't really have an ending that's satisfying in any way, shape, or form. And so I wasn't interested really in watching the TV show because I knew Neil Gaiman wrote it, and it actually it doesn't have a great ending, but it actually has a pretty good ending. I, like I'm pretty satisfied with it. I I think they missed a few beats that could have really taken it to a a really awesome level but it was shocking but my understanding is good omens 2 neil goes back to his normal i'm not going to give you any type of satisfying ending Uh, and so i haven't watched it yet i would not even remotely agree with that statement not even this is not coming from me there is an obvious obvious thread to the next to good omens three and he has publicly said that the he and terry always planned for three Mm -hmm. he had no intention of doing the other two after terry's death but then he received a posthumous letter saying please finish the story right so and see and my theory and there's no way for me to approve this but my theory is in that letter it said and oh by the way it's the only book i wrote that i hated so please if you're going to finish it Use my ending that I created that was supposed to be in the book that you refuse to use. That's just my theory. I, I'm, I don't, pretty sure, I don't. I'm pretty sure it doesn't say that because I think they were very good friends. <laughs> Certainly. But just because uh, you're good friends doesn't mean that they didn't have fights about where the story should have gone and and Terry lost. Um, that's just my theory. And that's why the season one actually has a decent ending. Good Good Omens 2, at the end of Good Omens 2, I felt incredibly fulfilled by the story. So, and I mean... We'll see, I will eventually be watching that. That's one that me and my wife plan on 
Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that, that was just me. You, you don't have to agree with me, but I, I personally felt incredibly fulfilled by the end uh, of that story. The writer that uh, I did Gen Con with, uh, me and him argued the entire week that we were there because he thinks that um, uh, Free Guy has a good ending. And I'm like, that movie was awesome until the last five minutes. And it has the worst ending. I have no idea what Free Guy is. I haven't seen it's, it. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Free Guy. I could be wrong. I'm, I'm sure it is. But I mean, I I watch so few it's, movies. It's Well, it's yeah. uh, Ryan Reynolds' movie where he's just a computer program, basically, inside of a virtual world. Um, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's called Free Guy. It sounds familiar. Like, the title sounds familiar, but I haven't. So, so I watch more tv shit series than i watch movies right because i can throw up an episode watch an episode and then go do something so it's only a 40 minute commitment whereas a movie is like an hour and a half a two hour commitment and i'm like right. i have to carve out a part of my day for that right um, um i mean i'm not watching anything at this point because i'm just so crushed under the weight of way too much work that i've taken on but uh, but yeah, so it's free guy, and it it's it's got a brilliant ending. I mean, it's got a brilliant story all the way up to the ending. Like it's it's great every bit of it, and then neither of the two main characters actually overcome anything. And he's like, no, it's very satisfying because you you know the the bad guy does lose everything. I'm like, yeah, he loses everything. Again, it's it's kind of that uh, Joe Abercrombie story. So. At the climax, when he's going to destroy the service, she's figured out that the world is is everyone in the world thinks it's real, and so she, you know she's created this world that has become this sentient thing, and um, so he's got an axe and he's going to chop up her server. She's like, "It's fine, you win. I'll give you everything. Just don't destroy that." And so he literally wins. The bad guy literally wins, and that's where the story ends. That's the overcome. And then later they do some news reports that a year later he lost everything because he mismanaged it. And I'm like, I, I don't care what happened to him a year after the story. Like mm -hmm. what? No, she should have overcome that. And I had like 10 different ways that the story could have ended with her actually overcoming him, but she doesn't, she just gives in, gives him everything he wants. And then he just mismanages it and loses everything later. And it's like, no, no, it's not. It's not a good ending. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be totally satisfied with that. It, it, to me, that would feel like karma is winning, right? You know, and I, I do. I do kind of want, like, in, in the end of Good Omens two, and I'm not going to spoil anything. But in the end of Good Omens two, our our two um, our angel demon demon combo of of Tenet and 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 um, Charlie, um, they overcome. You know the the. Like they they do overcome the thing, you know. Um, well, it's it, it's one of my closer friends, and they know how I judge stories, and they know also my loathing for Neil Gaiman because of the fact that he has such weak endings. And so it's just what he told me. He was just like, "Look, I've watched it. I know you're not going to be satisfied with this. Um, you're going to feel that it went right back to Neil Gaiman's normal uh, lackluster endings." I felt incredibly satisfied by it. But bear in mind that I do also like Neil Gaiman. So, you know, that guy. Well, and, and also bear in mind, everybody who's listening, I am ecstatic when people watch what I consider as a piece of garbage story and absolutely get, you know, thorough enjoyment out of it because you paid for that. I am very happy that you got enjoyment out of it. I do not fault you in any way. That is literally what it's there for. You should get enjoyment out of it. Um, I'm talking about me as a fan and yeah. where they fail me as a fan. Mm. And so you can't fault me just like I don't fault you for enjoying it. You can't fault me for not enjoying it. No, of course. I mean, every every person, you know, can enjoy or not enjoy whatever they like. That's that's the point, right? That's we have different tastes. There are different audience, different yeah. genres. But endings are part of what you need to think about when you're doing your stories. What ending are you building to? How are people going to overcome it? Because and also remember, oh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, be, because if you don't have a satisfying ending, like people, if people don't walk away with a sense of satisfaction, even if it's a book two in a series or whatever, it's still got to come to an ending. Like one of the series that I gave up on was, I swear the author was in love with cliffhangers. 
And I don't mean like little cliffhangers. I mean, the books, every book in that series ended in the middle of a battle with a battle unresolved. And the second time he did that to me, I'm like, I'm done. I'm out. I'm not reading the next book. I've got cliffhanger fatigue. I am done. Yep. Um, yeah, no. Um, every, and I'm saying this, the reason why I'm stuttering is because um, the realm actually breaks this rule, sort of. Um, because it's every four novels that actually is a story arc. But we are putting out a novel every three months. So, you know, you don't have long to wait. It's just that instead of reading one story in one book and then continue to the next book um you're reading four um but at the end of that fourth you have really eight story arcs that end satisfyingly they continue but they all also you know all eight of them have a satisfying ending at the end of the fourth book of each of the fourth books um but i am telling eight complete trilogies so you know i can't do eight stories every single book and have them all end in a satisfying way and i when i was plotting it i was like there's no way and so really what i did it's a five book series in my mind it's just that each book is broken up into four novels so so i'm still hitting it you're still getting that satisfying ending with each season um but i am running it more like a tv show more like a you know it's a it's a series and mm. so at the end of the season which is four novels you'll get your satisfying endings uh, and then the story will also be continuing from that point. But yeah. within that season, there's no way I can close out story arcs. I don't have enough time. I mean, yeah. writing eight trilogies, like it's crazy when I took a step back, you know, because you go, oh, 20 novels. You've got, you know, it's 4.4 million words. You've got all day. You can do anything you want. You can chase any rabbit. You, you can just write for days. And then I take a step back and I go, oh, wait. Every character only gets 15 episodes. Yeah. So 15 episodes to tell their trilogy. Um, I don't have all day. Yeah. Like I actually have way less room than I ever imagine I would. Mm. Uh, if I had to think about it, I mean, I can't do it more than this. It's already going to take us five years, you know, to yeah. publish this whole thing. But if I had to think about it, I'd be like, no, I probably should have said I was going to do it in 30 novels or even 40 novels, but no one's going to read. That's too good. It's already a lot asking for 20 novels, mm. uh, even though we're coming out with one every three months. But um, but yeah, it's actually a lot less than I thought that I had. So mm. it's a fast story. I mean, every single thing, you're just always on the edge yeah. of your seat. You're always moving forward. It's, yeah. it's really cool. But yeah, we, um, we're getting a little far afield here. So, so you must have a narrative conclusion. Is yeah. my my point. like if you don't leave me satisfied and I'm done with your story, then like even my my you know my novellas for the erotica, they have a thing that they build up to, there's a climax point, the hero has some struggle there, they overcome something, you know, there's a slight denouement. Like you have to have an ending. It has to leave me satisfied. Yep. And now people can have different conclusions. Like we, Terry Drake and I differ on Neil Gaiman's endings because I am mostly satisfied and left mostly satisfied with these endings. I don't think they're his strongest suit, but, you know, <laughs> I'm right. at peace with them. Um, I think the reason why they affect me, just to close that loop, is because he is the best at everything else. Mm. I think if he was just a normal writer and a normal whatever mm then having a normal ending probably wouldn't affect me as much. But because everything else is as good as it gets, that like, there's such a contrast. Conclusion, leave me on the peakiest of peaks. Why must you disappoint me? <laughs> yeah. It, it kind of, I've, I've, I have actually thought that, that might be my biggest problem with it. It's yeah. that everything else he does is so freaking amazing. Mm that it seems like he should also be able to stick that landing. Mm -hmm. um, but he does this great routine and then he lands and wobbles all over the place and falls to a knee and then, you know, finally throws his hands up and be like, I'm done. And it's like, that was a terrible dismount, dude. It was just, <laughs> after a flawless run, that was a terrible dismount. So, yeah. So I give him low scores. <laughs> 
I don't know why I started doing the Olympics, but, but that's where my brain <laughs> went. Um, so yeah, I think I think that is a fairly good wrap up of this. We've been through the germination of an idea, uh, can come from anywhere. Then picking your character and deciding if it's a fish in water or a fish out of water story that you're telling and which one works better. Working through until you have your theme and then remembering to properly build to a climactic end point that you hope is going to leave your readers satisfied. Yeah. And that's and how you build That's the, story. the best you can do. And that's why you have to, you know, the last podcast that we did, I, I really, really liked because we... Mm -hmm. And we didn't really kind of mean to, but we meandered into the realm of um, being a critique er and being a critique e. But a part of being a critique e is also not just the writing, but it's also the story. And so being able to let people read it and take that feedback, and you know, if if a bunch of if you love your ending, and you let ten people read it, and eight of them are like, "Man, there's just no ending here," and you're like, "No, no, there is an ending. It's this." And they're like, "No, no, I saw that, and it didn't. I don't care." Yeah, then you work. should not you know, just be pigheaded. You should listen to them. So if you haven't watched last week's episode, you really should. I, I was very, very happy with how it turned out. I think last week's episode is fantastic. But yeah, if you if if a whole bunch of your beta readers say to you, uh, your, your, your ending comes out of nowhere, it feels days ex machina, I didn't really feel fulfilled, like... Mm, Those maybe. are huge red flags for a storyteller. Yeah. Huge, 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 just right. Go like one of two things has happened. Either your ending doesn't work or you don't have a build up. Yep. You missed right? elements that needed yep. to be there. So, so if they say it's Deus Ex Machina, go back and look for where you didn't put up proper build up to it, where you didn't plant the like the seeds correctly so that it can blossom in the end. And if they say yeah, it didn't leave them fulfilled, Go look in your story where you've left open threads, because I promise you that's what happened. You've got open threads sitting in your story that you never concluded. And they're like, but all of these things that I expected an answer to, you just, you gave me nothing. Yeah. And that's why readers feel unfulfilled. Yep. Yeah, 100%. Couldn't say it better. That's a great place to end it on. And we will see you. That is a satisfying ending. <laughs> yes we will see you for another one